thank you for all coming along and coming out this Wednesday night. I know it's busy this time of the year in the clinic, so I really appreciate that. Just the flow of the night, we're going to start off with Danielle Houlihan taking us through atopic dermatitis. Then we've got one of our tech vets, Annabelle Robertson, that will take us through the new product, Derm Defence. Um, you've got your entrees coming now. We'll do main meals by 8.30. Then we'll serve dessert at 9.10. And we'll have you out of here at 10 or a bit before. So, yeah, that's the flow of the night. So here's our lovely two speakers um, that I'd like to introduce to you tonight. The first is Danielle Houlihan. Danny's a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Dermatology. She graduated from Murdoch in 2007 with honours. She started working in busy small animal practices in both Sydney and Portland, Oregon, before completing a dermatology internship in Perth. Danny then moved to UC Davis to join the dermatology service at the William R. Pritchard Veterinary Medical Teaching Hospital as a resident. Danny fi finished her residency in 2013 and became a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Dermatology the same year. Upon completing her residency, Danny continued to work as a clinical dermatologist at the UC Davis, providing instruction to undergraduate students and consulting on referral cases. Danny enjoys all aspects of veterinary dermatology, but is particularly interested in otitis, immune mediated skin disease, and allergic skin diseases. Outside of work, she enjoys horse riding, diving, and hiking with her two doggies, a multi poo andal, Andy and an Australian Kelpie Jackson. So if you can give Danny a warm welcome. Thank you so much to everyone for coming out tonight. Um, and throughout this um, talk, I'm happy to be interrupted any time if you have any questions. Um, and Andy, my multi-poo, multi doesn't actually do much hiking. I'm one of those people that has her in a little backpack. Um, and, and the Kelpie does most of the walking. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about atopic dermatitis and the skin barrier. Um, and um, thank you very much to Hills for having us all tonight. Um, Hills is very generous in their um, sponsorship of not only um, beautiful evenings like this, but also of continuing education. Um, so atopic dermatitis is um, a response to environmental antigens and it has a genetic component um, because we're all familiar with the breeds that we most commonly see atopic dermatitis in and we'll go through those shortly. Um, previously we thought that the most important route of exposure was respiratory exposure to antigens but now we think it's probably percutaneous absorption of those things um, and it is a hypersensitivity that's mediated by IgE antibodies and um, one of the things that we're doing more research on at the moment is barrier dysfunction and um, that's a very popular topic also in human atopic dermatitis and we'll go through that shortly. Um, so the age of onset is quite variable and I think the most common age of onset of atopic dermatitis that we're familiar with is 12 months to 3 years but I think that age range can actually be much broader. Um, I think that it's not uncommon to see dogs that are less than 12 months of age that um, are presenting with signs of atopic dermatitis and if there's been a significant geographical move they can really present at any age. So for example my multi-poo Andy who is now 19 and a half and showing no signs of slowing down um, never had any skin problems until I moved to Davis, California. And then suddenly at 14 years of age, she became a pruritic dog because she'd been exposed to new environmental antigens or allergens. Um, and so I always, uh, when I'm taking a history from a client, ask if there's been any significant geographical moves. So Adelaide to Sydney or Adelaide to California, um, because there's always the possibility they can develop signs uh, later in life. Um, the breeds that we see atopic dermatitis most commonly in, lab Labradors, Retrievers, German Shepherds, Sharpays. Um, another breed that I'm seeing atopic dermatitis in very commonly is the French Bulldog, which you've probably seen in practice as well. Um, and there doesn't seem to be a sex predilection. Um, the signs that we most commonly see are pruritus that's often associated with erythema and the areas that are most typically affected are the face, the feet uh, and under the arms potentially. And then um, conjunctivitis is kind of a debatable one because there's not really any good literature on how often dogs with atopic dermatitis also develop conjunctivitis but I think we see it relatively frequently. Um, so this is a picture of a dog here um, with some erythema in the interdigital area. And then another one that's also got some alopecia and erythema there. And then this is a cocker spaniel here that has some crusting, like kenification around the eyes and some alopecia as well. 
And then this dog I could easily buy has scabies too, but this was actually an atopic dog. So um, alopecia, um, hyperpigmentation and lichenification around the pinna. And then another dog here with alopecia and erythema. And then sometimes the signs of atopic dermatitis or allergic dermatitis can be relatively mild. So I don't think that the erythema surrounding the um, muzzle or the nose here is particularly impressive. But this dog was a 10 out of 10 pruritic. The dog was rubbing his face constantly on the ground. So I don't always think that the severity of the erythema correlates with clinical signs. Um, and then another dog here. So we're starting to get some secondary infection on the ventral abdomen. So those circular areas of hyperpigmentation starting to form um, and epidermal cholerates. Um, and this dog here, Cooper, actually had uh, atopic dermatitis and also a concurrent food allergy. And um, he's a good example because it's really hard to clinically distinguish atopic dermatitis versus a food allergy because clinically they look almost identical. And there is a little bit of crossover between those conditions too. Um, and then a Shiba Inu here. So lots of hyperpigmentation and alopecia forming on the ventral areas of this one. Um, and this is quite a moderate to severe erythema, and this was actually on the pinner of a dog. Um, and then I just touched briefly on cats. Um, so in cats, um, we don't have as much information on atopic dermatitis in cats as we do in dogs. Um, and so it's really hard to pigeonhole cats into a box. So typically if a uh, dog comes into us and they have become itchy within a 12-month to 3-year period of their life, um, we can be uh, more convinced that they potentially have atopic dermatitis. But I think with cats, the age range is really variable for when they present with atopic dermatitis. Um, and in cats with atopic dermatitis, we typically tend to, see, tend to see them focusing on their face, head and neck. Um, although in a study that was done, they did um, think that potentially cats that really had facial or head and neck pruritus was more commonly associated with a food allergy. Um, and the presentation in cats can be really variable. So you can get a miliary dermatitis or potentially um, eosinophilic granuloma complex, so um, plaques, granulomas or indolent ulcers. Um, and then some cats are very delicate in how they uh, manifest pruritus and just have a self-induced alopecia um, without the erythema and other things that go along with it. Um, so this cat here, just a little bit of erythema, some excoriations around the preauricular area. Um, this one here, some lesions on the neck there as well. And cats can also be um, particularly aggressive with how um, pruritic they are. So I once had a atopic cat come in that had been so pruritic that the zygomatic arch was actually exposed. Um, and then here we've got some hyperpigmentation um, and uh, erythema and alopecia around the periocular region. Um, this cat here also has quite a lot of exudate around the periocular region as well. And then this cat just screams dermatophytes to me, but this was actually an atopic cat. Um, and just as a rule of thumb, I would recommend that any pruritic cat that comes in to see you has a fungal culture, um, because I think that dermatophytes um, are potentially missed in some cases. And um, my kind of protocol is when a pruritic cat comes to see me, if it hasn't already been performed, I will do a fungal culture on them. Um, and then this guy was kind of a gentle pruritic cat. So he doesn't really have any erythema or a secondary infection. He just has that symmetrical alopecia on his forelimb. And then we've got a cat that has some alopecia on the, uh, the paws here. And I think that pedal pruritus in cats is definitely much less common than we see in dogs, um, but we certainly do recognise it. Um, and when you're inquiring with a, um, a cat owner how itchy the cat is, um, I always make sure to mention that we're including licking as a form of itching um, because I think that's how most cats will manifest their pruritus. Um, and then in dogs and also in cats, we certainly see secondary bacterial infections. So Staphylococcus pseudintermediates is the most common bacteria that we see. Um, if you're reading literature, probably prior to 2008 or so, it might be reported as Staphylococcus um, intermediates. Um, and typically we're going to see epidermal cholerates with papules and pustules. Um, so this is our dog that we saw here before. So we have these circular areas of hyperpigmentation and then peripheral scale and erythema, pretty classical presentation for a pyoderma. And then this is a nice close-up of an epidermal cholerate where we've got a peripheral ring of crusting and then a close-up here as well. 
And then I always like to include this slide because when we look at this dog, we could potentially just say there's dry skin or dandruff. Um, but if we were to clip him, we'd see most likely papules, pustules and epidermal collarette. So um, when we're seeing dogs that look like they might just have a dry hair coat, I think that should trigger little alarm bells for a potential bacterial pyoderma. Um, the other organism that we see commonly uh, in dogs with atopic dermatitis is malassezia. Um, so malassezia likes to affect the warm, moist areas, so the pores, under the arms, um, the intertrigonous areas around the mouth, around the vulva. Um, and this is a case of a dog that had malassezia here, so in the interdigital area. And this one I like to point out too, because the actual um, skin of the paws on this dog was not all that impressive, but you can see that the claw is discoloured in that proximal area there. Um, and I don't uncommonly find malassezia when I perform cytology of those areas, and those dogs can be intensely pruritic. So um, how I would perform cytology of the claw um, is I would get uh, either a scalpel blade or a spatula and just scrape that claw very lightly and then smear it onto a slide. And it's usually relatively easy to identify malassezia easier in those cases. Um, and then with malassezia, it's not uncommon to also see alopecia, hyperpigmentation and lichenification. Um, and in cats, when I see malassezia, it really doesn't happen as commonly. So there are some breeds of cats, for example, the Devon Rex, that will see malassezia in more commonly. Um, but if I see generalised malassezia in a cat, I try and rule out other possible causes. So occasionally they will have another systemic disease, so either feline leukaemia or AIDS, potentially diabetes. Um, and so I usually do at least an FELV, FIV um, and a basic um, CBC chem on those ones. Um, and the best way to see malassezia, um, I find, is to do tape cytology. So I think that tape cytology can be a little bit daunting um, when you're initially starting to do it because you do pick up a lot of background debris and it's hard to kind of wade through that to see the action. Um, the other thing I like to do, and I mentioned this before, is a spatula. So I'm not sure if any of you guys have seen this in practice. It's made by a company called Fisher, um, and it's actually completely blunt. And so um, the other thing I like to use this for is skin scrapings for Demodex, and it's really useful because if you have one of those silly dogs that's jumping all over the place and you're trying to scrape around the periocular region or potentially the pores, um, you could not actually cut a dog with that if you tried, but you will get deep enough to do a deep skin scraping. Um, now, they are a pretty pretty hard to come by um, and I haven't seen them available in Australia so if anyone wants one just let me know I'm happy to give you one um, I get them from my friend in California but um, in California they're considered a weapon um, so they're actually quite hard to source even from the states sometimes um, and then um, when we're doing tape cytology, um, there's two different ways to uh, stain your tape cytology. So I use DiffQuick for uh, most things. Um, some dermatologists will dip the tape uh, in the red and then the purple stain. I just do the purple stain. I think the visibility is just as good and also saves you a minute or so. Um, and so we've got some malassezia under the microscope here. So the one up the top here is done with a direct impression. So I think the malassezia are more evident on that one. Um, and down here it's a tape cytology. So um, one other thing I like to do with tape cytology is focus in and out. I think you've got multiple planes on your tape cytology um, and it's a little bit easier to identify things if we're focusing in and out. Um, and then as far as how we diagnose atopic dermatitis, um, really we've diagnosed it before we do any testing, so based on our history. Um, so typically they're going to be less than seven years of age unless there's been a significant geographical move. Um, the distribution of pruritus is usually feet, face, axilla, potentially ventral abdomen. And by this stage we've probably ruled out a food allergy and also ectoparasites. Um, and to rule out a food allergy, um, you can use a commercial uh, hydrolyzed diet like Hill ZD, um, or you can do a home cooked novel protein carbohydrate diet. Um, I find with my clients that um, they tend to do the commercial hydrolyzed diets more commonly than the home cooked ones um, because it's um, a lot of work to do it. And I had to do a home cooked diet for my Labrador and I lasted about four days. And so um, it is easier for a lot of people to do the commercial diets. 
Um, and then, if we've diagnosed atopic dermatitis based on our history and physical exam, you can potentially proceed with skin testing and blood allergy testing. Um, but I always make it very clear to the owner that the only point of doing either the skin test or the blood test is if they want to do desensitisation, because they really can't avoid any allergens in the environment very easily. Um, so it's an academic exercise, unless they're willing to follow through with the desensitisation. And um, I recommend doing both the skin test and the blood test. Um, I think that they're testing different angles of the immune system. So the skin test is testing the IgE that's bound to our mast cells, whereas the blood test is testing the circulating IgE. And I'm always surprised at the results I get. So sometimes there's really nice correlation between the two tests. But more often than not, you get two completely different profiles. So I wonder sometimes if our desensitisation isn't working, if we've potentially missed allergens by not running both tests in conjunction with each other. Um, and I say to my referring vets um, up in Sydney and Canberra, um, I'm happy for them to run the blood test and then send the clients to me for the skin test and then we can correlate the two results together. Um, and so now I'm just going to talk a little bit about the skin barrier um, because this is a topic that has received quite a lot of attention, not only in veterinary dermatology but also in the human dermatology field. Um, so just a little bit of anatomy, but not too much. Um, so we've got our, uh, our skin here, and when we're talking about the skin barrier, the, mo the layer that we're most interested in is the stratum corneum. Um, and so within the stratum corneum, which is the top layer of the skin, we have our keratinocytes, and we also have our lipid matrix kind of binding those keratinocytes together. And so just a little close-up here, once again, we've got our keratinocytes or corneocytes and then our lipid matrix. And the three uh, most important components of that matrix are ceramides, free fatty acids and cholesterol. And potentially the ceramides and free fatty acids we can manipulate to some degree. Um, so when we're talking about barrier function, um, we think that there's an abnormality in that lipid layer, so that binding layer for the keratinocytes. Um, and there's also a binding protein called filaggrin that we may have a decrease in. Um, and I'm just going to skip to the next slide because it explains it uh, quite nicely. So this is a representation of a normal dog. So we use a bricks and mortar model. Um, so we've got our bricks, which are representing our keratinocytes, and then our mortar, which is our lipid matrix. And everything's nice and held together. Um, in a dog with atopic dermatitis, we have a little bit of destruction there. So we've got our keratinocyte, and then our lipid matrix is not binding everything nicely together. So what's happening there is water is evaporating through the skin, and we call that transepidermal water loss. Um, and because there's a defect in that lipid layer, we're also allowing our allergens to penetrate. So we're sensitising our dogs and predisposing them to atopic dermatitis. Um, and I'm always very careful um, when I explain this to clients and talk about transepidermal water loss because I had one client in California, and most people in California are a little bit crazy, um, but one client in California actually thought that it was necessary for her dog to always be surrounded by water. So wherever she went, she'd have multiple water bottles and water bowls because she thought the dog would dehydrate. Probably not going to happen. Um, and so this is a nice little picture here. So this is our intact epithelial barrier, so normal dog, and hovering around under the skin are our antigen-presenting cells. Um, and they're going to be pretty unexcited in a normal dog because we're not going to get a lot of allergen penetration. Um, but in a dog with atopic dermatitis, we get our allergens penetrating and then they're binding to these antigen-presenting cells and stimulating an immune response. Um, and then we may have atopic dermatitis. Um, in humans, when they've done research on the skin barrier, they've actually shown that there is increased water loss, so increased transepidermal water loss, um, and that certain components of that lipid matrix are also modified, so probably decreased ceramides, um, which we also identified in dogs, and defects in the lipid lamella. Um, so in dogs here, once again, altered structure, altered ceramides, decreased lipids, and increased transepidermal water loss. And these pictures demonstrate it quite nicely. Um, so this is the picture of a normal dog skin. So we've got our keratinocytes here, um, and then we've got our um, lipid lamellae here, and they look nice and homogenous. Everything looks really uniform. Um, and then we switch to a picture of a dog with atopic dermatitis, and you can see everything is really discontinuous. So there's really no uniformity in that picture at all. So a very clear defect in that layer. 
Um, and so there's a dermatologist based in Florida, Rosanna Marcella, and she's very interested in the skin barrier. Um, and she did a review paper not only on the skin barrier defect in humans, but also on the skin barrier defect in dogs. Um, and the reason I point this paper out is because she had a, quite a few useful clinical recommendations that we can potentially apply. Um, so one of the studies that was reviewed um, was topical application of ceramides, free fatty acids and cholesterol. And if you remember, those were the three components of our lipid matrix in our stratum corneum. Um, and they showed that when we applied these products, there was an increase in the lipid lamellae and an improvement in the stratum corneum ultrastructure. Um, and two studies that were done using this specific product, Alloderm, showed significant clinical benefit. Um, now, at the moment, we don't have access to this in Australia, but we do have access to potentially similar products. Um, so another study that was done, and we do have this in Australia, um, is Dermascent or Essential 6. And I'm not sure if anyone has used this in practice. I'm quite a fan of this product. Um, and in this study, they actually went on not only to evaluate the, um, the ultrastructure of the stratum corneum, but also the clinical benefit. And in dogs that receive, atopic dogs that receive this product, they had uh, decreased pruritus scores clinically. Um, another study that was done was to evaluate the oral administration of essential fatty acids, and um, Megaderm was the one that was used in this study by Verbeck. Um, and they did show that it improved the structure of the stratum corneum, but they didn't really evaluate whether there was any improvement clinically. Um, and so I think the thing that we need to take home from this study um, is potentially we need to be focusing a little bit more effort on um, repairing our skin barrier in these atopic dogs. Um, and in humans, where they think that um, uh, potentially infants are predisposed to atopic dermatitis because their um, parents have had atopic dermatitis and there's a genetic component, um, they actually get them to smother them in emollients um, as infants. And they've shown that that can potentially decrease them developing atopic dermatitis later in life. Um, now, I don't know if that's a good option for any of our canine patients for a few reasons. One, we don't really have a good grasp on how, um, you know, on how common it is or the uh, mode of inheritance of atopic dermatitis. And the second thing is they have hair, so it will make it a little bit more difficult. Um, so I think this is probably the most relevant part of the talk, which is management of the atopic dog. And um, when I was in general practice, I would say probably 70% of what I saw on a daily basis was atopic dogs or dogs with otitis or um, cats with pruritus. And so I think it's really good to have a good handle on how we manage them. Um, and so I often draw this diagram um, on the whiteboard for my clients and I explain about the pruritic threshold. So every allergic animal and every animal in general have a pruritic threshold. So for example, we might have a Labrador that has atopic dermatitis, but the atopic dermatitis is relatively mild. Um, but then we develop a food allergy, so we go over our pruritic threshold. And it's not uncommon for dogs to have more than one type of hypersensitivity. And I think by the time they make it to see me or another dermatologist, they usually have multiple things going on. Um, on top of the food allergy, secondary to our pruritus, we've developed infection, either with malassezia or bacteria. And then we get pruritus. Um, and then we may develop fleas as well. Um, and I always think it's really surprising um, how many clients just think it's impossible that their animals could ever have fleas. Um, and I say to them, unless your dog lives above 6,000 feet, there are fleas in the environment regardless of whether you see them or not. So it's essential that we're on flea control. Um, and so, to keep below our pruritic threshold, we really need to control all of these flare factors. So, if we control for our flea allergy, and um, in general for controlling uh, any sort of flea allergic dermatitis, I prefer the oral preventatives. So, Nexgar, Brevecto, Comfortis, any of those would be fine. Uh, controlling our infection, either with oral or topical medications, and then controlling our food allergy by using a novel protein carbohydrate um, or a commercial hydrolyzed diet. And then we're relatively comfortable with our atopic dermatitis. And the other thing that I would point out on this is um, dogs can develop a food allergy at absolutely any age. So just because um, you've been managing a case for atopic dermatitis and suddenly at 12 years of age we become more pruritic even though our atopy has been relatively well managed, I don't think there's ever any harm in doing a food trial. Um, and it's not uncommon for me if I've been managing an atopic uh, patient for some time to actually repeat a food trial later down the track. 
Um, when we're managing atopic dermatitis, we're using multiple things, usually at the same time. And um, I think that I'm a little bit more fortunate um, in the sense that I think that when clients go for a referral, they're usually a little bit more compliant than when you see them in general practice. Um, and I'm usually having them do a lot of things at the same time. Um, and so I'm often using a combination of topical therapy. And if we can control a pruritus using topical therapy and the owners are compliant, that's really the preference. Um, but usually we're adding in systemic medications as well. And we'll just go through all of those really briefly now. Um, so topical therapy is great because we're delivering the active drug to the skin and we can potentially avoid some of the, th uh, the side effects that we would see with systemic therapy. Um, I also like to use topical therapy not only con to control pruritus but also to treat pyoderma. So um, we've got a lot of great topical antibacterials on the market, Resiclor, Bactroban, not so much anymore, um, potentially Flamazine that we can use for focal areas of pyoderma and then for more extensive areas, shampoos like Maliserb, Pyoderm S, Pyohex or um, Poor Mediderm would all be fine. Um, so I love to use topical therapy on the feet and you get those occasional or probably more frequent dogs now that just won't let you touch their feet but where the owner's compliant and the dog will allow I think that there's no reason in, in a pruritic dog with uh, pedal pruritus that we couldn't use topical therapy either to control infection um, or to control the itch level. Um, and so um, with the topical therapy, I think that owner compliance or patient compliance is probably our biggest barrier. Um, and then the other thing we need to consider is ingestion. So I really think that a dog would need to consume a really large amount of topical steroids to actually probably have any significant side effects. Um, and so this is a dog here where there were too many topical steroids applied and these are the biggest comedones or blackheads you've probably ever seen. Um, and this was a client who was going through a bottle of Court of Ants every week um, and she's given us a nice demonstration of what occurs there. So we've got skin thinning, comedones forming there. <laughs> Um, and as far as topical products that I use to control pruritus, um, I like Cordovance or hydrocortisone acepinate. Um, it's a really sophisticated molecule and I find that, um, it, you know, uh, and as far as the directions I give to clients, I usually just say use daily as required, um, although potentially not to the point where you develop what I just showed you. Um, and then the other thing is mimetazone or Elecon cream and that comes as a cream, ointment or lotion. I typically just use the cream um, and you can either script that out to the clients to get from a pharmacy or you can stock it in your clinic. Um, I use it really commonly, uh, not only for atopic dermatitis, but also for other things potentially, like discoid lupus erythematosus, it's sometimes useful for as well. Um, Tacrolimus um, is not available as far as I'm aware as a, uh, a commercial product in Australia, but you can get it compounded through Bova. And um, how I like to think of it is almost like a topical cyclosporin or a topical atopica. Um, so I've used this in quite a few atopic patients and um, it seems to be relatively effective. Um, the only thing that I will say is that um, when humans use tacrolimus ointment, they report that there's stinging or a burning sensation. Um, and I found in quite a few dogs, the owners will say they really resist the application. Um, the other thing is it is actually quite expensive so it might be cost prohibitive for some owners too but that's another option if you weren't wanting to use topical steroids. Um, and then systemic therapy, I think for the most part, is probably the easiest mode of therapy for most of our clients. And um, we'll go through each of those now. So um, atopical or cyclosporin, um, I don't use uncommonly. Um, the most important thing I'll point out here is I'd always recommend using brand name where you can. Because, um, for example, when we use compounded formulations, I don't know that we can always be 100% confident what we're actually receiving. So if you were to give a dog compounded cyclosporin and four weeks later the owner says he's still really itchy it did absolutely nothing I'm not sure whether it's because we weren't actually delivering enough or the right type of cyclosporin um, or because it's just not going to work for that patient so I think cyclosporin probably works for about 70% of cases um, and I always try to use the atopica where possible um, and the other benefit of cyclosporin or atopica um, is that after an initial four week period we can usually reduce the dose so um, I have clients update me every two to four weeks um, via text message. Um, sometimes they update me twice a day, that's fine. Um, and so um, after four weeks or so, we try reducing it to every other day and see how they go. And a lot of my long-term atopic patients who are on cyclosporin or atopica twice a week. Um, in cats, the dose is slightly higher. Um, so this was a case here at day zero, um, atopic dermatitis and day 90, looking a little bit happier. Um, and once again here, and then later on in 2004. 
Um, with any drug, though, we have potential side effects. So I think the thing we see most commonly with cyclosporin is um, gastrointestinal side effects, so whether they're anorexic or have vomiting or diarrhoea. Um, I recommend to clients that they keep the cyclosporin capsules in the freezer and give them frozen. Um, I don't think that it affects efficacy, um, but I think that it reduces your likelihood of having GI side effects. Um, and I know that um, Novartis or Elenco recommends that we give the um, atopica without food, but I normally give it with food, and I think your risk of GI side effects are a little bit lower there too. Um, I'll just bring up the next pictures because they go through the other side effects really nicely. Um, so hypertrichosis or excess hair growth. So we've got some in the pore of a dog here and then around the muzzle. Um, and then gingival hyperplasia. So that's a pretty severe case of gingival hyperplasia. And I can probably count on two hands how many cases I've seen. And I've used a lot of atopica. So it's not all that common. Um, that wouldn't stress me out all that much. I'd probably just try dose reducing the atopica by 50% or so and then re-evaluating four weeks later. Um, and then this is papillomas on the nose of a dog that was on atopica. And then hypertrichosis on a cat. I almost think that that's kind of a cool side effect um, because the cats get, or dogs get this excess hair growth and it's not harmful. Um, and then just to mention on cats quickly, using atopica or cyclosporin in cats, it really depends who's standing up here, what information you're going to get. Um, so Mike Lappin, who's an infectious disease specialist, I remember I went to one lecture that he gave once and he just stood up there and it was meant to be on using atopica or cyclosporin in cats and he said, don't do it. Um, and I don't think we shouldn't do it, but I think we need to be a little bit more cautious because there have been reported fatalities in cats that have active toxoplasma infection or cats that acquire toxoplasma infection while they're on cyclosporin. Um, and so my kind of protocol is that I'll do uh, basic blood work on a cat before starting them on cyclosporin, um, including uh, an IgG and an IgM titer for toxoplasma. Um, so the IgG, if it was positive, would indicate that the cat had previously been exposed to toxoplasma, um, a positive IgM would indicate active infection. Um, and so probably the highest risk category for a cat to be on that's receiving atopica would be to have a positive IgM. Those ones we wouldn't start on atopica. Um, the, the next highest risk category would be a negative IgG, so the cat's never been exposed to toxoplasma, and a negative IgM doesn't currently have infection. Those is, that's the category where fatalities have been reported. Now I don't think that we can't give those cats atopica, but I I think we need to counsel our owners. So the cat should be kept indoors at all times and they shouldn't be fed any raw meat. Um, and I think that if we're following those safety guidelines, then we're probably okay. Um, probably the safest category for cats to be in is a positive IgG, so indicating they've had previous exposure, but a negative IgM. As far as I'm aware, there's been no reported fatalities in that category, but I would still be recommending to the owners that the cats are kept indoors and they're not fed raw meat. Um, so I don't generally prescribe atopica to cats cats unless owners can follow those guidelines. Um, and then the other weird thing I've had in a cat um, is a cat developed salmonellosis in the lungs that was on atopica because the owner was feeding raw chicken. Um, so definitely always feeding cooked meat and not cremated, just cooked is fine. Um, and then um, when we're using atopica, the sort of circumstances that I'll use it in is if I can't use um, steroids for some reason, I think atopica is fine. So if we're trying to prepare for allergy testing or you have a Cushingoid or diabetic dog, I think that those are all um, suitable circumstances. Um, and then, um, you know, if they failed other therapies, so they failed steroids or need high doses of steroids long term, I think that atopica is okay. Um, Apoquil is a new drug that we've probably all been using a lot of. So um, I think, um, you know, potentially of the dermatologists at least, uh, for most of Australia, I probably use quite a lot of it because we had it over in the US before we have it in Australia. Um, and we're very lucky to have it. It's certainly a useful drug. And um, how I explain it to clients is that it essentially inhibits the transmission of itching going to the brain. Um, and the recommendations are to give it at 0.4 to 0.6 mg twice a day for two weeks and then taper it down. I almost always start it at once a day. I don't know how many clients just keep going twice a day and can't follow instructions. And then the other thing is as well, um, you've probably seen those cases that start off at twice a day for two weeks and you drop them down to once a day and the dogs become really pruritic again so the clients get frustrated and up the Apoquil dose again. Um, I normally just start them at once a day because if Apoquil is a drug that's potentially going to work for them, um, then hopefully it works at the once a day frequency um, rather than having to drop it down. Um, the other thing is as far as how many patients Apoquil 
Apoquel works for. I think in the study it was 66 or 70 percent of patients that benefited from Apoquel. Um, in my experience, I definitely find it's more effective at that twice a day frequency, and if we drop it down to once a day, it becomes less effective. Um, but we do have the potential for bone marrow suppression if we continue it at twice a day frequency, so we do need to drop it down. Um, they've recommended not using it in patients that have a previous history of cancer or Demodex and also dogs that are less than 12 months of age. Um, and it is okay to uh, skin test a dog that's receiving Apoquel. Um, now, I don't use a lot of Apoquel, so probably within the last 12 months I've used two bottles of Apoquel. Um, I think that it's a useful drug, um, but I am a big fan of steroids. Um, and the thing is, um, I think that with steroids, as long as we're using them at appropriate doses, we've been using them for a really long time and the side effects are predictable and they are relatively safe. Um, and so the circumstances that I will use Apoquel in is if a dog, or um, and I've used it in a few cats too, but if a dog is requiring higher doses of steroids than I'm comfortable with on a long-term basis, um, I'll switch them over to Apoquel. Or once again, just like Atopica, if I'm trying to avoid steroids for some reason, um, for uh, diabetes, hot, uh, Cushingoid dogs, um, then I'm happy to use Apoquel as well. Um, with steroids, I'll usually start dogs at about one mg per kg and then taper. Um, and I usually taper about every seven days. And I explain to the clients what we're aiming for when we're using steroids is the minimum effective dose. So the minimum amount of steroids that keeps the dog or the cat comfortable. Um, and so, as I said before, I'll usually have them text me every two to four weeks and we'll adjust the dose based on the dog's itch score. So when I initially see the client, I get them to tell me how itchy the dog is on a scale of one through ten. One not itchy, ten super itchy. Um, it's pretty interesting how many clients don't understand that scale. Um, so you'll have a dog that comes in that's tearing itself to shreds in the room and I'll say, all right, one to ten score, one not bad, ten awful, what number is he? And she'll say, maybe a two. And I'm like, let's review the scale again. Um, but it's all about client perception. So at the end of the day, we're trying to treat our dogs, but the person we need to make happy is the client. Because if the client perceives that the dog is less pruritic or happy, um, then that's probably a good outcome. Um, in cats, the dose for steroids is a little bit higher. Um, and as far as antihistamines go, I don't think on their own, unless in those mild atopic cases, they're particularly effective. Um, in the review paper that was done on atopic dermatitis, the two antihistamines they found to be the most effective were cetirizine or Zyrtec um, and also chlorpheniramine. Um, I think that the most useful place for antihistamines is potentially as a steroid sparing agent. So if we're giving antihistamines in conjunction with our steroids, we can usually get away with a lower dose of steroids overall. Um, and long term, antihistamines are extremely safe. Um, and then essential fatty acids. So this is something that um, hopefully we're all starting to use a little bit more. So diets that are high in fatty acids not only have anti-inflammatory but also immunomodulatory properties. And the two fatty acids that we use most commonly are omega-6s and 3s. Um, so in some research that has been done using omega-3 or omega-3 and 6 combinations, they've actually shown that using those we can potentially get away with a lower dose of steroids or a lower dose of cyclosporin. Um, but I always explain to clients that they're a nutraceutical, not a pharmaceutical, so they're not going to respond to them overnight. It takes time for things like fatty acids to be incorporated into cell membranes. Um, so we want to continue them potentially for at least 12 weeks before we evaluate efficacy. Um, when I've been using uh, fatty acids previously, I would typically have the owners purchase um, cold-pressed fish oil or evening primrose oil, and um, I usually uh, dose those at about 1,000 milligrams per five kilos, um, but a lot of dermatologists will do 1,000 milligrams per 2.5 kilos. Um, I think that you tend to see more GI side effects when you're going at that frequency. And um, if you think about it, a 40 kilo dog might be on 8,000 milligrams of um, fish oil a day. That's actually a lot of capsules to give to a dog. So I think that your client compliance really decreases at that point. Um, and so we are very fortunate that we have a diet on the market, Derm Defence, which Annabelle will go in uh, more detail, um, that already contains the fatty acids. And um, I can vouch that this diet is palatable because Hill sent me some samples, um, which I did manage to use in some patients before the Labrador ate the rest of them. Um, and so it is a quite tasty diet. 
Um, and then we touched on this briefly before as far as atopic patients and doing allergy testing. Um, once again, always stress to your clients that there's no point doing that unless they want to do desensitisation because, um, you know, we can potentially reduce their exposure to, for example, house dust mites by um, modifying our cleaning methods or modifying how we wash their bedding, but we're not going to completely eliminate it. Um, and then with desensitisation uh, in uh, patients, as far as how efficacious it is, um, it can be a little bit variable. So most of the studies that will say uh, desensitisation is about eight, 70 to 80% effective, um, and I think that's probably true, but we need to recognise that there's a, a broad range of responses. So within that 70 to 80%, probably the minority will do so fabulously that after 12 to 18 months on immunotherapy, that's all they require and absolutely no other medications. But the majority of that category will do better and maybe have a 50% reduction in medications but still require some form of therapy. Now, we would still consider that a success because if that dog is on 50% less steroids, less Apoquil, less Atopica, that is still a good outcome. Um, and so this is a picture of a skin test here, which hopefully you can see better from down there. Um, so we have our two controls. So we have saline, which is our negative control, and then histamine, which has our positive control. Um, and then we go through and we test grasses, weeds, trees, insects, mould, um, and a few other things, and we record the reactions. And our positive control is generally our largest reactor on the panel, um, but this dog was quite allergic and had multiple reactions that were much larger than our positive control. Um, and so I've already kind of talked about the desensitisation. As far as lifelong treatment goes, that's another individual patient thing. So when we start them on the allergen-specific immunotherapy or desensitisation, um, in my patients, once they get to the maintenance interval, the injections are given every three weeks. Um, and after 18 months, we kind of reevaluate their progress. If they've improved, and by improved, I mean they're doing so fabulously they're not on medications, or 50% less medications, um, then we would continue and often try try and reduce the frequency. So instead of giving injections every three weeks, we might give them every four, five or six, depending on what they'll tolerate. Um, if they haven't improved at the end of 18 months, I usually repeat the skin testing free of charge and just see how we're travelling. Um, and so as far as atopic dermatitis goes, um, it's very unlikely that it's a disease that we're ever going to cure. So it's definitely chronic care. Um, and I think it's important to say that to your clients when we're talking about allergies because otherwise they vet hop. They get unhappy that one vet hasn't fixed the problem. Um, but there is no vet that's ever going to cure them of allergies, but we can certainly manage them and make them much more comfortable um, over the long-term course of their disease. But it's usually going to be a combination of different things. So allergen-specific immunotherapy plus or minus other medications and diet modification. Um, and so that's really all I had to present to you guys tonight. And if you have any questions at all, I'm happy to take them from you now. Sorry? Sorry? Uh, hello. <laughs> uh, so I've got, I've got a few questions, if that's okay. okay. Um, uh, we haven't heard about this fabulous diet, but when a dog's on it, is there still advantage in giving essential six? Um, no, you don't need to. So if you're feeding, if the dog is eating uh, derm defence, then you wouldn't need to supplement with additional fatty acids. Right. Um, and that's, you know, what, it, it's good to mention that now because I've been, and I've only been using the derm defence for the last month or so, but I've been using it in lots of other cases too. So um, in other cases that I would typically use fatty acids, I've been trialling derm defence. So symmetrical lupoid onychitis or discoid lupus, I'll try derm defence and we'll see how it goes. Right. Um, is there a place for oh, sorry, um, permoxin spray in insect trialling? Yeah, absolutely. So if, um, you know, for example, fly bite dermatitis or if I was to do an intradermal allergy test and the dog tested strongly positive to multiple insects, um, then I would usually have them use permo As long as there were no cats in the household, I would usually have them use permoxin spray daily. Right. And, and the last one, the, if a client only wants to do one test, is the intradermal test more accurate than the blood test? No, not. I mean, there's, so what I would say is they've done a study on uh, the efficacy of desensitisation based on a skin test and the efficacy of desensitisation based on a blood test, and they're probably just as efficacious. But as far as I know, no one's done a study on doing both a skin test and a blood test and then the efficacy of combining both of those results to do desensitisation. So I think that I have pretty good success because I'm running both of those panels in conjunction with each other. Um, and 
once again, it depends on who's up here. So if you speak to um, another dermatologist, they may say the skin test is potentially more accurate than the blood test, but I just don't think that's the case. I think that they're both effective modalities, but they are both testing different angles of the immune system. So by running one and not the other, we're potentially missing allergens that the dog is allergic to. Um, the type of um, blood test that is done is important. So in Australia, um, and I think in South Australia, you're able to use um, Gribbles as a lab to send your IgEs to. Um, IDEX is also reputable. Um, if you're sending your blood allergy test to a lab that is also testing for food allergies, um, I probably wouldn't send them there um, because blood allergy testing for food allergies is really unreliable. Um, so Gribbles um, I use for all of um, my IgEs um, or IDEX is fine as well. And, and last one before I hand it back, actually, I thought another one. So just reiterate, you prefer a topica to apoquil then? Um, I wouldn't say I prefer one or the other. I'd say that they're both useful drugs. But um, with atopica, I think that we can usually taper it down. So even though atopica seems like the more expensive drug up front, I don't think of any cases where I can get Apoquil down to twice a week. So that's going to be an ongoing cost on a regular basis. Whereas atopica, we can usually get them down to twice a week or every other day or um, taper the frequency. Um, but the most common drug I use is a combination of topical steroids, PRED and antihistamines, to be honest. I mean, I could probably count on two hands the number of dogs I have on Apoquel and Atopica for atopic dermatitis. Yeah. Any other questions? You've got a catch, you ready? Yeah. No. <laughs> um, you mentioned earlier that you prefer oral flea prevention um, rather than topical. Why is that? Um, I think with the topical flea preventatives, the speed of kill is often not as good. And the other thing is, um, you know, even if they, you know, we say you can wet them, wash them, whatever, part of it's going to be washed off and it's just not as efficacious. And so um, I think with the oral flea preventatives, we don't have to factor in if they're swimming every day or if they're getting bathed every week. Um, and the speed of kill is usually a little bit faster as well. Yeah, so um, NextGuard, Brevecto or Comfortis are probably the most common ones that I use. And um, just as an aside, um, in case you weren't aware, um, NextGuard I think now has a label for Demodex as well. So um, I think in the study that was done by Muriel, they were dosing it at every four weeks. Um, I dose it at every three weeks for Demodex. And if I'm using Brevecto to manage Demodex, I dose it at every eight weeks. And um, since those two products have been on the market, I haven't really been seeing a lot of Demodex. So um, I think it's probably going to be a disease that we see a lot less commonly. And um, certainly... Certainly for the last year and a half, I haven't used ivermectin to manage any cases of Demodex. And also scabies, both of those products are likely to be effective as well. If they're on a... If they're on a food trial, which flea preventative are you using? Uh, Brevecto. So, um, if, I mean, you always try and avoid any flavoured medications. And so typically if I'm going to start them on a food trial, um, I'll give Brevecto because we can dose that three months later um, rather than having to give the next guard, which is every month. Anyone else? Um, if anyone has any questions or anything like that, um, I've, it, these, the Hills guys will pass on my mobile and email. Um, I'm happy for you to be in a consult, and obviously I don't work in Adelaide and you are spoilt for wonderful dermatologists here, um, but if you're in a consult and you need a quick answer, I'm happy for you to snap a photo and text it to me. Usually I'm pretty good about getting back to you. Um, and then um, they'll also send you a copy of all my slides as well. <laughs> So I'm really excited to be talking to you today about our Derm Defence Diet, which is our new diet for environmental allergies. Now, as Danny mentioned, um, most of these atopic patients are going to need management lifelong. It's a hereditary condition. And so often we're going to be managing them with drugs, often systemic drugs, shampoos, topicals, supplements. But now we also have a dietary option to manage these patients as well. And what I love about diet is pet Parents have to feed their pets every single day, so it's a great thing, um, so they're not going to have to keep adding supplements. So compliance is going to be good, hopefully, with, with the food. Hmm. Ah, perfect. 
So it comes, um, we've unfortunately only got a product for dogs, so our Derm Defence Dry in our 2.7 kilos and 11.3 kilos, and also our can um, stew available as well, which um, just helps because a lot of pet parents like to feed both wet and dry, so it helps with compliance. So as I mentioned before, we've designed this food um, for dogs with environmental sensitivities, in particular for dogs with atopic dermatitis, but it could also be really helpful for those dogs that are recovering from flea allergy dermatitis or they might be recovering from an ectoparasitic infection. So those dogs could also benefit from um, being on the Derm Defence diet as well. So when Hills were looking to develop a diet to help um, with the nutritional management of atopic dermatitis, there were really three main goals that we wanted to address. And first we thought it would be really fantastic if we could actually help or reduce the inflammatory or allergic type response. And it would even be it would be even better if we could actually help to reduce um, allergy sensitisation in those patients. We then also want to be helping to restore the skin barrier, whilst also to support um, the skin and coat health as well. And we were able to achieve all of these goals in the Derm Defence diet. And this slide just sort of shows you how many different components there are to the diet, because there's unfortunately not just one magic ingredient. There's a whole heap of different nutrients that are working um, and complementing each other to achieve these goals. So to help inhibit our inflammatory response, we've got our histogard complex and omega-3s. Um, and histogard complex is what's really exciting about this diet and what sets this diet apart from all your other sort of skin support type foods out there on the market. So our histogard complex is a blend of egg, polyphenols and also our antioxidant and lipoic acids. And then we've got a whole range of um, nutrients and vitamins there that are helping to restore our skin barrier and also helping with our skin and coat health. And you'll notice that some things like omega-3 fatty acids just keep popping up in it, um, and targeting um, sort of every nutritional goal there. So let's have a look at each of these points in a bit more detail. So first of all, we want to be inhibiting or reducing our inflammatory allergic response. And scientists at Hills Pet Nutrition have done a lot of research into this area and found that egg, lipoic acid, polyphenols and a blend of omega-3 fatty acids can really help um, in this area. So you may be thinking, why egg? And that's what I thought as well. But when you think about it, um, it's not that far-fetched. When we've got an egg, we've got a little embryo that's being protected by egg yolk and also egg white, and then we've got a shell. But the shell, eggs can actually respirate. They're not a closed system. So eggs got to have some form of immunomodulatory properties. And what, what we found that it, it, it does, and it does actually help to um, modulate that immune response by inhibiting our delayed type hypersensitivity or our IgE response. And they've certainly done a pilot study looking at um, dogs with flea allergy dermatitis, and um, those dogs that were receiving egg definitely had a small um, reduced severity and duration of their flea bites. We've also done our own study um, at our Hills Pet Nutrition Centre in Topeka, Kansas. Um, it was just a pilot study, so we had um, 15 dogs. And basically what we wanted to assess was the effect of egg on um, wheel size and uh, immediate and also delayed type hypersensitivity, re hypersensitivity reactions with intradermal skin testing. So we've got these 15 dogs and we divide them into three groups. So we had one group that was fed the control diet. The second group was fed the diet with an addition of 4% egg on a dry matter basis. And then our third group received the same diet without the egg, um, but these patients had prednisolone on board as well at 2.2 milligrams per kilo. Now this study went for a duration of approximately 12 weeks. And so at week nine and week 11, we vaccinated all these patients with a novel antigen. Now this is an antigen that these patients will never be exposed to again. It was a key um, limpet hemocyanin, um, which is a bit of a mouthful. And then basically what we did um, after the second injection is we did intradermal skin testing with these patients. And so we measured wheel size um, 15 minutes after we did the intradermal skin testing to, um, to assess our immediate or acute type response. And then we also tested it at various time points um, up to the 120 hour mark to assess our delayed response. And what we found is that the food um, that had egg added at 4% significantly helped to reduce both the immediate and delayed type hypersensitivity response. So I like this slide because it sort of shows a graph, a, 
it's sort of a visual representation of what was going on. So you can see here, we've got our control group with our immediate and our delayed type reaction. And then we've got our um, group that received prednisone and also our group that received the 4% egg. And I think you can appreciate that um, the wheel size is much smaller um, than the control for both the pred, um, the group receiving the pred and the egg. And actually there was no um, significant difference between these two groups either. So we were able to conclude that um, a diet with egg actually helped to reduce that cell-mediated immune response. What you might be wondering was, did all these patients have, um, you know, what about humoral immunity? We know that our cell-mediated cell -mediated immunity was um, reduced, but what about, you yeah, know, humoral immunity? Did all these patients have an adequate response to the vaccination? And did, was egg affecting the response to vaccination? And so what we did is we actually did blood tests in all these patients, um, and we looked at plasma, and we measured um, our serum antibody titers and found, um, this is at week 13, and found that all groups had um, um, basically the same levels of antibodies. So we know that it's not affecting our humoral immunity and that it's only affecting our cell-mediated immunity. So the second component of our histogard complex is our lipoic acid and our other potent antioxidants. Um, and so not only is the lipoic acid a really potent antioxidant, but at, actually at high levels it can affect um, it actually has um, an effect on gene expression and it can reduce our histamine release and our degranulation of our mast cells. So quite, quite interesting and there's been a few studies on this. And then our third component to our histogard complex are, are polyphenols. And you might be wondering what are these polyphenols, um, which I also wondered. Um, but basically they're a group of bioactive compounds that occur naturally in so many of the fruits, vegetables and herbs that we eat every day. And there's so many different types of polyphenols out there and there's um, basically there's, they're classified based on their chemical structure and one of the most interesting groups are the flavonoids and there's been a lot of research done on those. So if you were to Google um, you know, immune response or mast cells and polyphenols, um, you would probably find quite a lot of information come up and a lot of citations. So it's a really exciting area of research. Um, but basically um, these um, compounds or nutrients have been, have been found to actually affect multiple pathways of our cell-mediated immune system. So what they can do is actually alter um, the way we respond and the way our inflammatory res cells respond to allergens, but also um, that what's interesting about them is they can actually reduce um, allergy sensitization as well. And so they do this by binding to allergens, and so they make them less recognisable to our antigen-presenting cells or our dendritic cells. But what they also do is then they act on multiple pathways of this cell-mediated immune response as well. So they act on our T cells and they can cause apoptosis. They reduce interleukin-2 release, which is a growth factor for T helper 2 cells. Um, and they decrease cytokine release from these cells as well. And then they act on B cells and reduce IgE. And then they also, at really high levels, can actually help um, to stabilize mast cells and um, reduce their degranulation um, and release of histamine. So they have heaps of different um, modes of action, and they're a really interesting area of research. All right. So omega-3, we kept seeing omega-3 pop up on that slide at the start, and it works on multiple, I guess it has multiple functions, um, but we know omega-3s um, are really great anti-inflammatories, and so we've got really high levels of anti-inflammatories in this, um, or high levels of omega-3 in this diet. But not only is the amount important, it's also the ratio. So in this diet, we've got a low um, omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, so it's about two to one. And so this, what this does is it actually helps to reduce the amount of inflammatory eicosanoids that are produced. All right, so we'll move on to the second point, um, the second nutritional goal, which was to help restore the skin barrier. And you can see under this heading, we've got lots and lots of different nutrients. So we've got our omega-6s, 3s, we've got various vitamins and also zinc. So let's have a look at omega-6s in a little bit more detail, in particular linoleic acid. Um, and... Omega-6 is often found in high levels um, in things like vegetable oil, so your soybean oil, um, your sunflower oil, and other things like flaxseed. I um, mean, in the derm defense, we use um, soybean oil and we also use flaxseed, and flaxseed has the added benefit of being a really nice soluble fiber and helping um, improve digestive health as well and our microbiota health. 
But why omega-6s are so important? Danny was mentioning before um, that a lot of these patients with atopic dermatitis have a defect in their intercellular lipid layer, um, and often their ceramides aren't that great. And so um, omega-6 um, actually helps um, to improve this intercellular lipid layer. And by doing that, we're creating a nice hydrophobic barrier, so we're getting less of our transepidermal water loss. And also, we're, we're forming a better um, structural barrier between those corneocytes and getting less um, antigen penetration as well. So we're going to get, I guess, less inflammation and pruritus occurring. These are some of the other nutrients um, that are important for the skin barrier. So you can see there's a, a lot up here. So we've got our vitamin A, and we know that that helps with our epidermal cell maturation, and our zinc, which is really important in the biosynthesis of our fatty acids, which are, again, really important in our intercellular lipid layer. But also they're important for keratinization of the skin as well. What I really like um, are the vitamin E. And so I mentioned um, before that there's a lot of lipid, um, there's a lot of fat in our epidermal layer. And so we need to have a really potent um, lipophilic antioxidant um, to help reduce um, oxidative stress and damage from free radicals. And we, we do this by adding high levels of um, alpha tocopherol or vitamin E. Um, and this can actually clinic, um, significantly reduce clinical signs in atopic dogs. There has been one study looking um, that I'm aware of, there's probably a lot more than that, but one study I'm going to talk about um, is they did, um, there was 29 dogs and there was a control group and another, um, they were receiving mineral oil and then the group, um, the other group was receiving vitamin E. This went for eight weeks um, and then they found that the Cadisi scores, which is a way of assessing atopic dermatitis, really significantly reduced in those dogs that were receiving vitamin E supplementation and that serum vitamin E levels um, significantly increased as well. So quite interesting. And finally, we obviously want to support our skin and coat health. Often these patients have terrible skin. They've, been, um, they've got severe excori excoriations. They've been scratching themselves silly, licking themselves, chewing themselves. And so we do this by providing high-quality protein. Um, and the protein in our dome defense diet is chicken, also a range of other nutrients. So I'm just going to show you this video quickly. So it's a bit clunky, but it really nicely goes through what I've just spoken about. Introducing Health Prescription Diet Derm Defence with Histogard Complex. Over 50% of allergy cases in dogs are caused by the environment around them. Environmental allergies decrease quality of life for both the dog and his pet parent. Let's look at what happens in the skin of dogs with environmental allergies. The epidermis is the skin's normal barrier to allergens. Since it is defective in atopic dogs, allergens gain access to the deeper skin layers. Body responds to the invasion by eliciting an immune response. Antigen-presenting cells deliver the allergens to the T-cells, sensitising them and triggering them to release cytokines. As a result, B cells produce IgE, which binds to the mast cells. When the skin is exposed again to these allergens, the allergens bind to the IgE on the mast cells, triggering release of pro-inflammatory cytokines and histamine. Inflammation is triggered. The skin is inflamed and pruritic. The inflammation and scratching further damages the skin barrier. The cycle of exposure and damage continues. To disrupt this cycle, Hills is introducing prescription diet derm defence with histogar complex. How does this new food work? Here we see the affected skin with its defective skin barrier and inflammation. Omega-6 fatty acids provide building blocks to help strengthen the skin barrier. High quality protein, essential fatty acids, vitamins and minerals including zinc, copper, vitamins A, E and B complex in derm defence help restore the skin barrier and aid healing. High levels of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids with clinically proven antioxidants including vitamin E help reduce inflammation. The Histogard complex, a proprietary blend of bioactive ingredients and natural sources of polyphenols, help reduce immediate and delayed hypersensitivity reactions. Derm Defence helps support a healthy immune response. Perfect. 
So once we had created our DEM Defence diet, we wanted to do, um, I guess, a case series to get an understanding of how this diet works in the real world. So we managed to get 20 dogs from 11 states across um, the US, and we did this study um, in April, May, which is their sort of springtime when there's a lot of allergies around. Now, to um, be a candidate to be in this study, these patients um, had to have a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis, and many of these patients were long-term sufferers that were on multimodal treatment at the time. Um, and I'd like to just mention that they were um, allowed to continue all their therapy throughout this study um, because we're not aiming to be able to cure or manage atopic dermatitis purely on diet. It's just um, an added part of our multimodal management. Um, but also it would be... Um, a bit unethical to stop treatment as well. So um, this trial went for eight weeks. And what we did is we asked pet owners to assess clinical response and also um, assess their pet's behaviour and quality of life. And then we also asked vets to do a modified Cadisi store, Cadi sorry, Cadisi score, so assessing atopic dermatitis signs, looking at things such as erythema, like vinification, alopecia, all those sorts of things, um, and then assess that um, at the end of the study. So let's have a look at what vets um, thought. And um, vets really thought that there was an overall improvement in the coat and skin, skin quality, and they saw that. Um, there was reduced standar, um, and the, the skin um, and the coat was a lot shiny and the texture a lot, more, a lot improved. Um, and pet owners um, also saw um, a lot of improvement. There was reduced redness, itching, licking, um, and overall improved quality of life. A lot of them mentioned that instead of their dog sitting there itching and chewing 100% of the time, um, they actually had a little bit um, more of an interaction with their pet, and they said that was nice because um, normally they just see their pet literally itching themselves um, silly, and that's, that's all they really had time to do. So it really did help to improve that um, pet owner and pet bond, which is lovely. So overall, um, this is looking at vets um, and also owners. Um, and you can see that the majority of people um, found that it was effective and they did want to continue on the diet long term. Um, and 79% um, either rated the diet as very or extremely palatable. So um, that's also good um, because people are hopefully going to want to continue on the food long term and compliance is going to be a lot better. So this is one of the patients from this trial and I just wanted to introduce you to Toby. And Toby is a nine-year-old malnutrited um, Yorkshire Terrier. And if you're wondering what this is, this is his ear. Um, and this is him before. And you can see that there's quite a lot of um, lichenification and a bit of hyperpigmentation. Um, he was on medications well before the study um, and continued them into the study as well. And then eight weeks later, um, you can appreciate, yes, his skin's not normal, but certainly there's been a bit of improvement there. It's a bit more um, obvious from these next photos. So this is his skin before. This is looking at his shoulder. So this is his head end up here, and this is his shoulder here, and this is all self-induced, so he's been just ripping himself to pieces, poor, poor thing. And you can appreciate um, that four weeks later there's hair growing back. Um, even though the study was only eight weeks, um, these, they, um, submitted, they continued on the diet um, after the study and they submitted this um, picture of his hair growth. And you can appreciate that it's almost completely grown back at the 12-week mark, which is great. And the final picture of Toby, um, this is his hox. So again, quite thickened, um, lichenification going on, quite a bit of hair loss there, and you can appreciate that a lot of hair has grown back there. So his owners were thrilled and his um, vet was also very happy and said that it was great for compliance of his, you know, it was the diet was really great for compliance for these owners as well. So that's the end of my talk about DEM Defence. But before I finish up tonight, I just wanted to go through this nutritional algorithm because I've had a lot of people ask me about, is this for food allergies? And the answer is no. We have our ZD, um, and our ZD is still our um, hydrolyzed protein diet. Um, it was upgraded this year, and we have a mean Dalton size of 1,000. We know that most food allergies are around 10,000 to 70,000, so it's, a lot, it's much smaller and it's less likely to bind our two IgE receptors and um, trigger degranulation of mast cells. Earlier this year, it was also upgraded to add, um, we added a bit more fibre to the diet to help with, um, I guess, digestive health and promote a healthy microbiota. We often recommend this diet for patients with inflammatory bowel disease, and a lot of patients um, well, some patients with our, um, atopic dermatitis may have some GI signs as well, so we felt it necessary to improve, um, improve in this area as well. And so 
Basically, if you've done your initial diagnostic workup, you've done skin scrapes, you've ruled out secondary infection, you've ruled out um, underlying ectoparasites, and you're suspecting that it's a food allergy, um, and you haven't done an elimination trial, then it's definitely worthwhile um, using the ZD for this. Usually what I would advise people to do is um, feed it for um, 8 to 12 weeks. If we've had absolutely no response and the owners have been extremely compliant by that 8-week mark, then it's probably unlikely to be a food allergy. Um, but if there has been a partial response, then certainly continuing it for that through three months. And I'm sure there's lots of dermatologists around this evening and you can have a chat to them and see what, see what they think. Um, if you're pretty sure, either if it hasn't responded or that it, you're really pretty sure that it is atopic dermatitis, then Derm Defence um, is the diet you would, would choose for these patients. Um, and as I mentioned, and as Danny mentioned, it's not just um, your atopic dermatitis dogs that could benefit. You know, dogs that have flea allergy or recovering from multiple other condi skin conditions could also benefit. Um, and just before I finish up, I just wanted to, I guess, reiterate that we've got um, a small bag. Also, it comes in a really large bag. Um, and I guess the important thing about this is telling people to store it properly. So storing it in the bag, making sure um, also when you're getting them onto the diet, doing a gradual transition of 10 to 14 days, but then storing the food properly because it does have such high levels of omega fatty acids in it, it can go rancid. So it's really important that they do store it in the bag, that they get all the air out of it, um, so that, it maintains, so that pets will want to eat it and so that it doesn't go off. Um, we've also got it in our stew as well because we do know about 40% of dog owners like to feed a wet and dry option together. So thank you so much for attending tonight um, and attending our launch and we really look forward to hearing um, your feedback on the diet when you start using it in clinic. Thank you.